This is Thursday, October 29th, 2015. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Charles Frazier. Welcome, Charles. May I ask when you were born? I was born in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And when? And 31st of July, 1926. Where do you currently live? I currently live in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Marital status? Married. Do you have children? Two children. Grandchildren? I got four, Lowe's. Great grandchildren? Five, yeah. Tell us a bit about Cambridge growing up. Uh, Cambridge was a very nice city, a university city. Uh, there was a, a mixture of uh, uh, races there, uh, uncommon for the areas that surrounded the uh, Metro West area. And what part of Cambridge did you grow up? I grew up in the magazine uh, beach area mm -hmm. near the Charles River. And what did your parents do for a living? They were part of a family business, uh, furniture moving and uh, storage. And did you have any brothers or sisters? I had one brother, uh, 20 months younger than me. His name was David. And Charles, uh, what do you remember about the Depression? I remember there were a lot of uh, uh, children <coughs> that were uh, poor. They, uh, it was pretty obvious and we shared a lot with them. My father made, I found out one time, $30 a week and that was considered pretty good money because he worked for his father. <laughs> so that helped. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really see the bad parts of uh, the depression. But you helped out wherever you could. We did, we did. Now Charles, uh, what schools did you attend? I, I, I attended the Morse Grammar School, Ringe Technical High School. I graduated there at 16 years old and uh, the next month after graduation, I turned 17. Mm -hmm. That's when I decided I got to do something here for the war. Let's step back a little bit while you were attending school. Uh, were you made aware, of course, of events happening in Europe and Japan? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> we were surrounded with uh, families that had people in the military besides relatives. And do you remember what you were doing when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor? I, I was home and uh, we were in the um, kitchen actually and it came over the radio. And uh, that's when we, were, we all looked at each other and couldn't believe it. A lot of words said, but you don't want to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> Did, were you familiar with where Pearl Harbor was? Or? Yes, yes I was. And you were still in high school. I was, oh yes, I was mm -hmm. still in high school, yeah. Before you entered the military, uh, can you tell us what you did during the war, like scrap drives, any home front programs? Uh, well, I was an air raid warden for a while. Also, uh, in my Junior and in senior year, I worked at a First National, and there we gathered the cans of uh, fat and so forth that people brought in, and we paid them pennies for, for it, and we turned all of that in. We all had ra ration books, of course. So it was, and uh, a big shortage of coffee. <laughs> and First National was a supermarket. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That was a. So you were a teenage the, air raid warden. Yes, I was. And my, what were your duties? My good friend and myself, uh, we've just, we practice. 
they would have air raid drills in the middle of the night. My mother would come in and say, the siren's going off. And I'd get up, get dressed, and run down to my post, which was one block away from me where I lived, and just patrolled it during it, knocked on people's windows, turn off your lights, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we, got, we were pretty uh, engaged mm -hmm. in the uh, wartime activities. What were you told about um, Boston, Cambridge, perhaps being attacked by the enemy? There was always rumors going around of that. There was stuff in the paper that, uh, you know, we needed to practice blackouts. Uh, the State House uh, Gilded Dome mm -hmm. was uh, painted black uh, just so that uh, we confuse the enemy if they decided that they want to bomb us or confuse the submarines, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But we didn't feel any real danger. During those years, did you uh, get get to go to the movies or stuff? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, life more or less continued on normal, except for those things like the rationing and mm -hmm. so forth, the drills. Mm -hmm. Even in school, the drills. Uh, other than that, it was mm -hmm. about the, the same as was before the war started. Okay. Can you tell us a little uh, more about ration cards? Uh, well, each, each member of the family had a ration card, mm -hmm. and that uh, gave you a certain amount each month for things that were limited, hard to get, and so forth, uh, like, like, like coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, there were separate ration cards for gasoline for the drivers and so forth. Uh, they, uh, they did limit you in, in what you could get. It was sugar rationing, butter rationing, meat rationing. Uh, fish was not rationed. So mm -hmm. that was a good alternative. So now you just turned 17. I just turned 17 on the 31st of July. The next day, I had been uh, looking at the services because I, I knew as soon as I turned 18, I was going to get drafted. So I didn't want to start college at that time. So I said, what should I do? I heard about the Navy. They had a V-12 program, which was send you to college to be an officer. I said, well, there's an opportunity. So I went over to the uh, post office building where they had the recruiting stations at that time. Talked to uh, them and I found out the V-12 program had closed. I said, but we still have openings mm -hmm. <laughs> listed. And I said, hmm. I said, well, maybe. So I got the papers, brought them home, broke the news to my parents. It was a lot of ooh and ah and ah. And <laughs> but they ended up signing. Everybody knew we had to do our things. So uh, on the 16th of August, I held up my hand and was sworn in to the Navy. And this was 1943? This was 43, yeah. Okay, you put the hand up. Now what? <laughs> they loaded us on a bus. <laughs> uh huh. And down to Newport, Rhode Island, we went. Boot camp. Was this the first time you were away from home? Really, yes, mm -hmm. uh, for any extended length of time. I had made visits out of state, New Hampshire, Maine, and so forth, but uh, you know, it was more or less holiday type of things, vacation type of things. You know. mm -hmm. Connecticut, I got as far as Connecticut, going south. <laughs> Never got to New York. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, Charles, and you're now in Newport, Rhode Island. Yes. And did you feel comfortable with the group? Yes, 
Yes, I did. I en mm -hmm. actually enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have been working uh, at the at the First National, which was a lot of physical labor, mm -hmm. so I was in good shape. So I didn't mind the, the mile runs in the morning and things like that. And at least you didn't have to carry fat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Some of my uh, fellow <laughs> uh, recruits were not as well off health-wise, <laughs> and those mile runs were terrible for them. <laughs> But you were used to them, so... I was used yeah. to uh, mm -hmm. running. I love running. And how long was basic? I believe it was six weeks total. That all? Wow. I could be wrong on that, mm. you know. My memory is not as good as it used to be. No. It was no more than eight weeks, anyway. Mm -hmm. I believe it was six weeks. They were in a hurry for certain mm -hmm. people. And you were among the certain people? No, that's kind of a good, uh, good story. I lucked out. <coughs> okay. Uh, we had, uh, near the beginning, we had the test, the standard test yep. that you had to take. Everybody had to take the test. And uh, the next morning, uh, one of the other guys in my company and uh, myself were called to the, to the office. Mm -hmm. And then we were told to go over to such and such a place. Mm -hmm. And then they told us we had done so well on the, uh, on the tests that uh, evaluating it, it seemed, I got to give a lot of credit to Ringe Technical School for helping me with that, mm -hmm. and so forth. And they thought we would make good electronic technicians. And it was another a set of schools. And if we accepted this, we signed, had a sign for it. We had to go. We couldn't change our minds. So that's how I got into electronics. When you were at Ringe, did they have anything like this? First two years, I took a college course, but the first two years it was mandatory. You took shop. And the shops were uh, automotive, machine shops, even forges metallurgy, uh, woodworking. So I got to know all the tools and everything. And those were uh, in that test, the first test I took. I knew all the names of the tools. I think that's what impressed them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you're on your way to being an electronic technician. Tell us what happened after BASIC. After BASIC, we were sent home for leave until we got a telegram saying, go to Chicago. I knew where we were going, but they were kind of backed up, so I had to wait, which was I, I had a nice two weeks at home, saw my girlfriend, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, then went to Chicago to the Naval uh, Pier, and that's where they had the primary school. And uh, we went over all the basics of uh, you know, the mathematics and the uh, basic uh, electronics information. Now, what and was electronics back in 1943? Vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes. <laughs> That's the basis of the whole thing and the weakest link. 80% <laughs> of the problems we encountered <coughs> were always tubes. And how long were you in primary school? That was uh, four, four weeks, uh, but I became sick during that time. So I missed some of the stuff, so they kept me for another four weeks. And I kind of felt bad because some of my friends that I had made, you know, they moved on and I was left behind, so to speak. But that was good because I really learned the basics. Which brings us now to the end of 1943? That finished in 43, in December, and I went to Texas A&M College and arrived there New Year's Eve, 44, <laughs> in the middle of the night. 
the middle of the night on New Year's Eve. What a way to bring in 44. <laughs> Very tired from a long train ride uh -huh. from Chicago down to Texas on cattle cars, so to speak. Oh, boy. We call them cattle cars. They were troop trains. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now you're in a very different part of the country. Absolutely. Tell us what happened next. Well, we, we stayed there three months. And uh, because we finished that, part of the training, we automatically became uh, third class petty officers. So we had a stripe. But we didn't have our own symbol. We had the same symbol as radio men that did work the radios, the sparks. And the reason for that was because we were going to be learning uh, secret material and we didn't want to be uh, singled out because of our rating badge. No exploding vacuum tube or anything like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I even built a radio in this, that three months. <laughs> that was part of the education process. Build your own. Okay. So now it is early 1944. Yes. You're still in Texas. Went to San Francisco. Now you're in San Francisco. Yes. What was happening in San Francisco? Six months of intensive training. Yeah. Six days a week. And study at night. We didn't get much time off. And what exactly were you studying? We studied every piece of electronic equipment you can imagine. We spent a month on just general electronics, a whole month on receivers, a whole month on uh, transmitters, sonar, uh, fathometers, uh, you name it. And the last two months were devoted to the secret process called radar at that time. Getting into pretty, pretty heady stuff there. Yeah, yeah. We, we, when we finished, we knew just how to uh, fix about anything mm -hmm. that was electronic. By the time you get out, it's the middle of 44. <coughs> Excuse me. Was this, um, did you get out before or just after D-Day, the Normandy invasion? D-Day happened when uh, I was in Virginia. Because at the end of schooling, uh -huh. I was assigned to uh, the Minecraft Center at, uh, at Virginia, near Norfolk. And that's when I found out I was assigned to a minesweeper that hadn't been built yet. <laughs> it was under construction. And for those of you who are into video games, this is not that kind of Minecraft. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. This is the stuff that goes boom yes, when you it hit does. it under the water. <laughs> all right, the Minesweeper has yet to be built. What were your duties? At the, mine, at the Minecraft Center, uh, we went out on small Minesweepers for practice out in the, uh, out in the bay, Chesapeake Bay. So we had, we had a lot of training, but we also maintained all the electronic equipment in the area. So we had our own workshop, and uh, we, we kept busy. We had a, there was a lot of equipment to maintain and keep up. We did manage to get a lot of liberty, too. <laughs> I mean, Chesapeake North Bay. Norfolk was a nice place. Yeah. Yeah. You're, uh, you're saying Chesapeake Bay. Ooh, crabs. <laughs> hmm? Sorry? Crabs, Chesapeake Bay. At that time, I didn't hear too much about bad, really? uh, crabs mm -hmm. and so forth. And All right. Now, you're in Norfolk. And how long were you stationed there? 
I think it was, uh, we got assigned to the nucleus crew of a ship. The officers showed up one day at my uh, shop while I was working, introduced themselves, and told me I was going to be on the ship and I was going to be on this crew. Mm -hmm. I think it was 18 of us mm -hmm. that were going down three months before the ship was scheduled to be finished. So we went down in the spring down to Savannah, Georgia, and the flowers were in bloom. Amazing. <laughs> we, we still thought of it as winter. Up and this is spring of 1945? No, this was um, 40, yeah, yeah. 45. Sorry. Okay, because yeah, you were in Virginia yes, for most that's of 44. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, 45, yeah. What were you hearing about the war? Well, I was hearing about uh, friends of mine that went missing mm -hmm. and some that died. Uh, we had uh, everything about the, uh, you know, what was going on, the ba Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. uh, that event was, everybody knew about that going on. That's when I found out my uh, future brother-in-law was captured. And, uh, yeah, we, uh, there was a lot of war news. Do you remember what month you reported to Savannah? I can't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. It had to be maybe in uh, March oh. or, or April. All right. So uh, this was a little before Franklin D. Roosevelt died. Oh, yes, it was. Okay. Yeah. That was April. And then VE Day was the following month. Do you remember um, what you were doing on the, the v, 7th? VE Day, the, yeah, the European mm -hmm. thing. I was still at, uh, no, I'm a little confused about that now. Okay. You know. uh, you uh, let's see. But you were now in Savannah, Georgia. Savannah, Georgia, yes. And the mine, and you're waiting for the minesweeper. Yes, every day we were on, went on a bus. There was a naval station out in, uh, towards the beach area. We went on the bus and went into the shipyard, and went went alongside with the workers. There was a chief warrant officer that uh, was in, in electronics, so he took me over. And he showed me exactly what was being put on, what I could expect. It was very helpful. So I pretty much knew everything about the equipment that I was going to service by the end of the time there. So when was oh. everything put together? Yeah. It will, I also had to go down to uh, Charleston, South Carolina to learn about a secret piece of equipment. They wouldn't even give me a notebook. <laughs> mm. I had to remember it all. I had two men, one after the other, day after day, telling me how, to, how this equipment worked and how to service it and so forth. What and did that to... turn out to be? Hmm? What did that turn out to be? Well, like, Today they call it Loran, uh -huh. but it was highly secretive at that time. Okay. Brings us to late spring 45? Uh, I think, yeah, mm -hmm. yes, late spring 45, okay. when we finally left. And then we started, we had to go back to the shipyard up north because they decided that uh, we needed more guns because mm -hmm. of the kamikazes. Yeah, okay. And they had to take a lot of weight off the ship to do that. Mm -hmm. So we had another stint at the uh, Navy Yard. Then we went through the commissioning, which was done up in the Virginia and the Chesapeake Bay. And that took a while. Mm -hmm. What was and the name of your ship? Red Start, USS Red Start. And Red Start is a bird common down in the Carolinas. And the type of minesweeper that we were on, 
the steel mines we believe were named after birds. Mm -hmm. Summer of 45, mm -hmm. looks like everything's all set. Oh, where we left the East Coast, we went through the Panama Canal up to Long Beach, California, and started putting on the final supplies to go to the Pacific. And uh, one of the supply runs, I was in charge of the crew, <clears throat> and the car started honking horns. We're looking around, what's going on? The war is over, the war is over. <laughs> and I said to myself, I made it, I made it. <laughs> I won't have to go <laughs> and get killed. <laughs> uh -huh. Kind of silly. So I was euphoric until I learned I, I remembered I had the duty that night and I could not get off the ship <laughs> to celebrate. <laughs> so I missed all the celebrations in LA. Oh no. Oh. That was a big disappointment. We, we, a few of us that had the duty, when we weren't out actually doing something, we went in the mess hall, coffee and so forth. And uh, we talked about the Russians. I said, believe it, I said, we're going to be at war with the Russians before you know it. We don't go on, they're allies. I said, no, I can see it coming. Well, I was wrong, but mm -hmm. we, we, uh, I found out later on when I went to Korea as a civilian, there was a lot of Russian military equipment that the North mm -hmm. Koreans left behind when they retreated. Mm -hmm. The war is over, but you're still in the Navy. I'm still in the Navy, and off we go. Across and where are we going? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're going over to Japan, uh -huh. and uh, we're going to clear shipping lanes. On the way over, I got to know one of the younger officers pretty good. He used to stop and chat with me in my shop. And he says, you know, we were scheduled for the invasion of Japan. Yikes. And he says, you know where we'd be. I says, yeah, first in. Mm -hmm. Minesweepers cleared out with the big stuff. But thankfully, you're going into Clear the mines. Oh yeah, first first uh, job op operation was in Nagoya Harbor. Mm -hmm. We went in there with two small YMSs, two wooden ships that we had uh, taken with us over to Japan. They followed behind us. They slowed us down. It took us almost a month to go across the ocean because of them. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that took us 30 days, and that's I think when the white hair started. Uh, we just felt, you know, at any moment while we were sweeping, that we'd go up, you know. We had all this ammunition on. Mm -hmm. Why? Nobody could answer. They had not told us to take all that excess ammunition off. The war is over. But we made it and uh, cleared the mines. And then right after that, we hit a, uh, we hit a rock that wasn't charted. And it broke, it bent up our port uh, appella. So we were out of commission. We could limp. And we limped around to the west side of Japan to a, a shipyard that was still op operable there and waited for 30 days it took for the propeller to come over from the United States. Charles, while you were in Japan, uh, what, was there anything you were doing during the 30 days you were waiting for the propeller? The 30 days? Yeah. The captain had us clean, chip paint, actually renew the, everything on the ship. And we weren't okay. that old. <laughs> mm. But he kept us busy and out of trouble, really. We got an occasional liberty for three or four hours during the day. They wouldn't let us go at night. Uh, they still didn't know how the Japanese were going to react. Mm. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Because you were, you were there right after the surrender, and I'm, I've been, I heard in previous interviews some Japanese were even told that the Americans were going to eat you. There was a lot of propaganda that had been mm -hmm. forced down their throats at that time, so they were very surprised when they got to know us. 
They were very timid at first, mm -hmm. but then they realized we're not going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. so. The propeller comes in. The propeller comes in. We, <laughs> we had scraped the bottom of the ship, put the propeller on, and then we started to work. And we got sent to various places and started sweeping mines again. This time, we're very complacent. We, you know, we're not even wearing our life jackets or our helmets or anything, mm -hmm. and we're sweeping mines. Can you tell us a little more about what was involved in sweeping a mine? Uh, what they do is they normally have several minesweepers with minesweeping gear on them, and they go in a staggered formation. They go across the supposedly minefield as far off from it as possible. Mm -hmm. And they would go down to the end, they return and come back and then keep doing that, laying buoys so you could see where you had cleared. So supposedly once you got that first lane cleared, then you're traveling back and you're overlapping. The first ship is overlapping in the supposedly cleared area and the other ships are following behind, but they're protected because of the mine sweeping equipment mm -hmm. that is trailing off in a V formation in front of them. So it's supposedly safe, but it doesn't always work. And what would a mine sweeper do once it encountered a mine? When a mine pops up, <clears throat> one, one ship is designated uh, to go and, and either blow it up or sink it. If if the mine was old enough, if the battery had probably uh, gone, and they only had contact mines at that time with those little horns around the, mm -hmm. the big circular thing. So those weren't active. But we found plenty that were still active, left over from the, you know, the war. And those usually blew up. We had to try a machine gun on them first, and if that didn't work, then the bigger guns, the 20 millimeters, and then the 40 millimeters pierced them, and they sank if they didn't blow up. <coughs> and the mine, the, was it like in the movies? The mines were just under the surface? One, uh, one mine, well, of course, it varied with the tide and the location. If you were near land, the tides varied the depth. The mine was held down by a chain or a cable by a weighted trolley thing that was on the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And it automatically had let out the mine up to a certain depth. We drew 12 feet on our ship. So anything that was higher than that was a danger. And uh, in some cases, they had, we were told by the Japanese that they would, might be as only seven feet deep below the surface. So that was, that left us very, very uh, vulnerable. Yeah. And I can see where the gray hairs are forming. <laughs> well, that, that started the first month at Nagoya. And uh, after that, we got used to it. The brain is a funny thing. You, you're scared to death at first, and then by the end of that month, we weren't fri afraid anymore. We didn't wear our life jackets. We didn't wear the helmets. And the same thing happened to the officers, because they didn't force us to wear the jackets and so forth. It was their job to, to tell us that we should. And they didn't. So it was very risky. We made it risky, too by not doing those things. So um, this is according to the notes that you had sent along to a friend. After you had the property place and then you were in Japan, you were in China and Formosa and Korea. Uh, well, uh, in the water off of those mm -hmm. things. We went down, <coughs> actually uh, in, the, in the middle of the winter, uh, we went down, so far, it was tropical. It had coral reefs and tropical islands and so forth. Uh, that was south, uh, southeast of Formosa. Mm -hmm. yeah. I forget the name of the islands. It was 
loads of them down there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, well, lucky, at least you didn't yeah. have to spend the winter up there. <laughs> yeah. Well, as I, I say in this letter here, the uh, 29th of December, we rendezvoused up at uh, the uh, passageway between Korea and Japan. It's called Tsushima Straits. And that was a place where they told us the mines were, some of them were seven feet under the surface of the water. Mm -hmm. But by that time, we had some Japanese coastal ships that had been fitted out with mine sweeping equipment. So they didn't draw seven feet. So we thought that would be safe. Mm -hmm. And according to this, you rendezvoused with another minesweeper known as the Minivet. The Minivet was a sister ship mm -hmm. built in Savannah, Georgia, too. And they just had come over recently. And we rendezvoused with a destroyer minesweeper. It had a Commodore on there, which is, by the way, just a wartime rank just below Admiral and he was supposedly directing the operation. And the next morning we started. Somebody must have flipped a coin because the Minivet had to lay the boys behind the Japanese ships. And we got the job of blowing up the mines. The first pass, they turned around. Oh, the first pass they brought up about 12 mines. They were just bobbing up like apples. And so as soon as they got out of range, we started shooting at them with everything we had on the port side. And we didn't get them all before they turned around and came back again. And then we stopped. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, as they were passing us, the men of it blew up. Excuse me. That's OK. You mentioned that the I Minivet... I thought I was over this, but I'm not. Well, you mentioned in the letter that the Minivet was still carrying ammunition. Yeah, just like us. And I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Did it strike a mine? Apparently, uh, the Japanese had missed a mine. I don't know. It, it, like I say, it happens sometimes. The mine doesn't break off and bob up, it just falls down under the wire, and bobs up again, and it must have hit it, right near the after magazine. And that's why within a half an hour she was gone. Were you able to save any of the Minivet crew? We saved, well, a third of the crew died. Mm -hmm. The other two thir <coughs> thirds between the Japanese and us, we pulled them out of the water, took them over to the de, uh, to the destroyer minesweeper. They hadn't even moved. We don't know why, but they took them on board, and then they they rushed down to Sasebo, which was our home base at that time, because they could go, uh, you know, a lot faster than we could. We were, we could only go 18 knots maximum. And we met up with uh, some of the crew after they were treated at the hospital and everything down there. And the first and only time on New Year's Eve, mm -hmm. they let us have uh, alcohol. <laughs> Medicinal alcohol. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cheer us up, I think. Yeah. And also, according to this, the, uh, apparently the Commodore got in a little trouble. <laughs> that was a rumor. We uh, heard that when he got mm -hmm. back to Pearl Harbor, he was tried, but mm -hmm. it, it was never mentioned in the newspapers or anything. In fact, this whole accident got maybe two inches in the newspapers back home. Mm -hmm. and some never heard about it. Uh, people sent the little notices, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, tell us what happened after. It is now early 1946. Yeah, okay. Um, I was told that uh, I had enough points to be discharged. I think this was in January or February. 
we were still operating, clearing mines. <coughs> but, mm -hmm. a big but, mm. I had a, uh, the rating I had was different, scarce. So I, I had to ride the ship back home. I had to stay with the ship. I couldn't get discharged right away. And so, what was your rating at the time? I was a second class petty officer. And by that time, we had our own mm -hmm. rating, a, a nuclear type of thing that um, showed electronics. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. That's OK. So we continued on, and then all of a sudden, they started taking people off the ship. We had just enough to operate the ship. And of course, the first ones to go with the higher rates that have been in longer. So, except for some key people, uh, and myself. And yourself. <laughs> I'm not calling myself a key people, but I was the only electronic technician on the, on the ship. We had to, uh, we got orders to go back to the United States, back to Long Beach, stopped at uh, Hawaii. First time I had fresh milk in months. <laughs> A nice lady at the YMCA there said, I'm sorry, we're out of milk, and I, I guess my face fell. <laughs> the next thing I knew, she was back with a quart of milk. She had run out to the store to get milk for me. <laughs> and boy, did it taste good. Oh, I bet it did. Yeah. Back at Long Beach? Back at Long Beach, uh, the, the next thing I knew, the, uh, the, uh, one of the officers came to me. And uh, he said, we have, uh, we'd like to have you ship over. And I said, really? He says, yes. He says, there's such a shortage of electronic technicians. They're all climbing out as fast as they can. He says, we're being left very short. And he says, if you agree to ship over, I think it was like three or four years, he says, you will immediately be first class petty officer. And then he said, by the time you turn 21, he says, you'll be a chief petty officer. Well, that was tempting. But I still wanted to go to college. I still had a girlfriend at home. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I thought it over, and I thought about some of the things that had happened, uh, some of the mistakes that had been made in that uh, I said, I don't think I want to do that anymore. You know, I told him, thanks, but no thanks. Mm -hmm. So then I got my orders to go back, and I went back to Boston, to the Fargo building, and was discharged in May of that year, 46. Before we get you out of your uniform here, uh, you did mention in the letter that you also, when you were out in Japan, you also saw the the damage left by the atomic bomb. Well, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on on our way home, uh, the ship was told to go. Uh, we were allowed to stop at the uh, Nagasaki, mm -hmm. at the harbor close by, and the local navy uh, people. Uh, drove us out in a bus and let us circulate around in there for two or three hours. It was a beautiful, sunny day, and people were out and about. Japanese people were out trying to restore their businesses. They had machine shops that were operating under canvases. I'm not sure where they were getting the electricity from, but they were very inventive. <coughs> So that, and the other thing, we stopped at uh, another place where there was an active volcano going on, Kagoshima was the name of the area. I'm not sure the name of the, uh, mm -hmm. the actual volcano, but we, uh, they put us on board uh, landing crafts and took us over to where we could see it actually blowing off on the island, and it was considered safe. But there was lava coming down in the, in, into the ocean. Uh, the outer shell of the lava was, was just warm. 
but at the inner part mm -hmm. had lava, because when it went slowly into the ocean, you couldn't even see it moving, but you could hear the creaking. The water was boiling up like crazy. Mm. And uh, then the wind shifted. They picked us up in the landing craft, and unfortunately the smoke from the volcano was going right over our ship. <laughs> so there was all this white ash that was dropping down, and we got out of there as fast as possible. And when we cleared the harbor, the hoses would come out, and we washed everything down, and my, my shop was a mess. Oh. I had to clean that up. It took me a couple of days to get all that stuff out of there. <laughs> <laughs> then the only other thing on the, on the way home, and out in the middle of the Pacific, suddenly everything went silent. The engine stopped, everything, the electricity went off, everything, we were dead in the water. What the hell happened? <laughs> you know? So uh, there was a lot of scrambling, and it turned out that the 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 um, the crew that manned the engines and so forth, the machinists, <coughs> they had turned a wrong valve and shut the fuel off to everything. <laughs> so it was just a matter of turning it back on and cranking things up again and getting underway. underway. <laughs> but <laughs> we were all looking at each other and saying, what the hell are we going to do? We can't even... <laughs> Get help! We can't send for rescue. You know, we didn't have any backup radios, anything. But it turned out to be just a false uh, alarm. Let's get you back to Boston, May '46. You're a civilian again. I'm a civilian. Uh, my girlfriend was working, so I went back to my house. My parents were working, so there was nobody home. <laughs> So I changed in my civilian clothes and I went over to the office of the moving business and there was my mother and my father eventually showed up and everything, you know, big reunion. That evening I had to go see the girlfriend. And <laughs> so, you know, it was um, quite a few months after the war ended. The war ended in August and I'm back in May. Hardly any uniforms on the street. When I had left the last time before the war had ended, there was soldiers, Navy, people, mm -hmm. Marines, everywhere. I got back, I hardly saw anybody in uniform at all. And uh, people acted almost, uh, you know, you saw friends and whatnot, it was almost like, oh, hi, you're, oh, you're back, huh? Okay, you know, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. nothing. No, no big thank yous or anything, you know, mm -hmm. nothing went on like that. Yeah. At the time you were discharged, you were Petty Officer Second. Second, yes. And yeah. do you remember what kind of medals you got or accommodations? Yeah, there was a, the standard ones. It was the American Defense. Mm -hmm. It was the Victory Medal and uh, the Pacific Theater. Uh, just three of them, mm -hmm. yeah. And Charles, did you uh, join any military service organizations, such as the Legion or VFW? Not for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. I, I, didn't, I didn't even join the uh, 20, 20, they called it the 20-something club, mm -hmm. which was, at that time, they were still giving out, for a year they did this, they give out twenty dollars a week to veterans until 52, they could get. twenty, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, but I didn't even take part in that. Did you go back to college or go to college? Oh yes, yes, yep. I went to Tufts. You went to Tufts. But I didn't finish at Tufts. I got into my third year and I got sick. Meanwhile, I had gotten married. <laughs> to this lady that you, mm -hmm. out there. Yeah, that was not the girlfriend at the time. <laughs> I met her afterwards. Okay. Girlfriend and I just didn't. Mm -hmm. And what was your major at Tufts? Engineering. Engineering, yeah. okay. Well, electrical engineering. <clears throat> you recovered, so, of course. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, yeah, I, I recovered, but I didn't go back to college. Mm -hmm. uh, like like Tufts. I didn't go back to Tufts at mm -hmm. all. I needed to make money. I had family. I was a child on the way. 
<coughs> so I signed up with uh, Philco Corporation and as a technical representative. And the first place I went was Korea. Mm -hmm. And that's another long story, but I won't go into that. <laughs> I did six months over in Korea, helping the Air Force. Was this uh, before the, the Korean conflict or after? This or? was in 1950 and oh after boy. the start. And I landed in, pre in Korea mm -hmm. after the Pusan perimeter was broken and we started moving north again. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and Uncle Sam didn't come knocking on your door again? They sent a letter. <clears throat> Actually, the first thing was a call. My wife took it. And she said, well, he's over in Korea. What's he doing there? <laughs> so she told him and everything, and they canceled the orders. Because I was in the reserve, you know. I had signed up foolishly for the reserves, but I, <laughs> I had. And uh, so they just canceled it. And by the, the time I got back, uh, I actually stayed 18 months over in uh, Japan and Korea, total. By the time I got back, there wasn't any more recall. So that was the end of my military career. Uh, when you were in uh, Japan and Korea, uh, were you there alone or was your wife with you? She couldn't come. Okay. That was one of the conditions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. That was so you were back in Japan yeah. after a couple of years. What were your impressions? Totally different. Uh -huh. You know, they had rebuilt. I, I went to uh, first place was Tokyo, and then just a couple of days, and then I went over to six months in Korea. And then I came back, and they said I had agreed to a year. And they said, "What? Where would you like to work?" Because there was all kinds of jobs in the Pacific Islands and whatnot, and uh, even in the Philippines, and uh, I said, well, Tokyo's a nice place. So I got a job in Tokyo, <laughs> outside of Tokyo. But. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when my year was up, the Air Force, I had done so much at the receiver site that uh, it fixed things that were b badly uh, in, in shape when I took over that they begged me to stay through the winter because that was a that's a very difficult time, winter time, for communications, radio communications. So I said, yeah, but come spring, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> My wife wasn't too happy about that, but at least it was bringing in some money. Exactly. Um, you did get back. Oh, I did get back, okay. yeah. And what happened after? After I got back to the United States, from uh, I stayed with Philco for a while, mm -hmm. and took on various uh, contract jobs. I worked at the Boston Naval Shipyard for a while, teaching electronics. Uh, I went uh, out to Oklahoma and got the teaching again, and uh, the Air Weather Service people they they needed refreshment, uh, refreshing and needed uh, cross-training, and I was able to do that for a couple of years. Mm. And I went on, on more. I don't know if you're interested Go ahead. or not. <laughs> but uh, one other job I did was at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, working with the Army, updating the specifications. Uh, I kind of enjoyed that job. I was working with the civil service people at the laboratories, mm -hmm. and uh, so that was nice, but that ended. And then I went to Rome, New York, again working for the Air Force. And uh, from there, I, I, I had met a friend who had been working in Japan, and I didn't know him in Japan, mm -hmm. but he was there in Rome, New York, and we got friendly. And he was an offered a job to work at a field office in Hanscom Field, right over here. Uh -huh. And he says, would you like to come and join us? I said, yeah. <laughs> My wife was itching to get back to Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> she had family here, too. Mm -hmm. 
So I ended up going to uh, working at Hanscom Field for, um, oh, it was quite a few, quite a few years. Then in, in the 60s, I got, Philco <clears throat> got a big contract to put in two air traffic control systems over in uh, Thailand and Vietnam. Of course, in Vietnam, I think it was going on in the 60s. So <clears throat> I left the field office, and so I was working as directly for the company now. And I almost got a divorce out of that because <clears throat> it was a secret contract. And I couldn't even tell my wife exactly what I was doing, and it was demanding a lot of hours from me and a lot of trips. I had to make trips back and forth to Philadelphia. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, that's, yeah, that was kind of a tough time, but we made it through. So I left Philco. Actually, after that contract, they didn't have much going in this area, and I didn't want to leave the area. So that's when I went to work for Raytheon. Mm -hmm. And I finished my career with Raytheon, 89. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing these days? Retiring. <laughs> no, what, I, what I'm doing is uh, uh, I've, I've got a place up in Maine, and uh, so we just, I inherited it from my brother, and uh, I decided to keep it. And that kept me busy. I got on the board, of, uh, management board, in the condo association, and uh, that was busy, and I've also done things at the uh, local senior center, mm -hmm. mainly in the computer club. Mm. So I do that. So you've had a pretty mm. interesting journey over the past 50 years as you've seen computers come oh, to yes. filling up this room to, to basically <laughs> handheld. I know. <laughs> Charles, how important has it been for you to serve in the military? I felt it was very important at that time. And the reason I felt it was important was because, to me, it was a real war. We had real enemies and real reasons to put our lives on the line. And I look at the, at the kids that went to Vietnam, especially Vietnam, and somewhat in the uh, the Korean War, which I, they called a police action. Mm -hmm. you know, it was silly. But at least nobody complained about the Korean War too much back here. Po politically, it wasn't out of favor. Whereas in Vietnam, my God, they treated the kids coming back terrible, terrible. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that they had a lot of doubts about why they were there, too. Charles, is there anything else before we wrap up this interview? I really can't uh, think of anything else unless there was more details about the jobs that I was doing, <laughs> but uh, I think you got the drift. Yeah, I think we did indeed. Charles Frazier, we thank you so much for coming and interviewing for the Native Veterans Oral History Project. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> glad to share my story with you. Uh -huh.